Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, just joined in. We'll just wait for some more of the audience before we start with our Facebook Live learning session for today. I get to find some shout outs here from Leanne Orlina Gomez, Justin Manmelarios. Morning. So Leanne is here joining us, Justin as well. I think some of my students also, both in the undergrad, um, the TCP levels, uh, those who have already graduated, uh, more likely will also uh, view in. Uh, hello to Ma'am Imelda Ladrera. Our topic for today is rather interesting and very timely. Can you also have like a thumbs up if uh, the audio is uh, loud and clear from where you are right now? So we got add around 16 viewers already, 17. Okay. Good morning, Ma'am Marian Barroso, uh, Lanor uh, Valerio, or Roland Valerio. I think the name is spelled uh, backwards. Uh, Jen Olina or Canilio. Evelyn Rivera, good morning. Uh, Ma'am. The Joseph make a still Siskar. Good morning, also, ma'am. Oh, Carl Joseph. Uh, thank you for watching. Ma'am Dek Tapalia from my PCP class. Uh, Rohail Suja. Good morning, also, from Occidental Mindoro. Ma'am Gina Lin. Good morning. Sir Leonard Finesse from my PCP class before. Uh, Mark Anthony Malinao also. Kel Adona Ancheta, good morning from Sambales. Reynaldo Simbulan, good morning, sir. Oh, Bea Patricia Santos from uh, Pibet PCP. Good morning, ma'am. Mary Peace Feliz Dario. Felizardo, good morning. Eleanor Go. Elaine Villasanta, Marian Aravalo, Aravalo, good morning. Mamalona de Lara, good morning also. Oh, Patricia Venus Ligarda from uh, Ramon Magsaysay High School, Manila. Good morning, ma'am. To Sir Mark Cedric uh, Sihion also. Jelly Dilius Rodolfo, a former student, good morning. Michelle Flores, Elsie Cab Cabalsa, good morning. Uh, I'm Rick Mendoza from uh, Orion Bataan. Good morning also. Uh, Joy Gabriel Soriano from Holy Angel University. Good morning. Sir Ryan Molina, good morning. I nice to see you here on Facebook Live. So perhaps we can already start uh, given the limit of time that we have. This is rather a very short engagement of around 30 to 45 minutes, hoping that uh, we get to have, of course, the most of our Facebook Live discussion. Okay. So the topic of my sharing this morning would be on uh, curriculum mapping. And um, often than not in my classes in both the undergrad, TCP levels, or whenever I am invited to be a resource speaker, this is one particular picture um, that came out in the Philippine Star, I think sometime um, 2013, uh, by Eugene Bacasmas. And this actually tells us of the current situation that we have for teachers. The teachers actually bridge understanding 
more so of course with the very idea that in this discussion for today we get to find ourselves as teachers in the junior high school uh, level so here again is our topic for uh, the short discussion and sharing so curriculum mapping in grade 7 to 10 you get to find there onto the slide also which i will be providing Vival also later on so that you can download the material you get to find also my email address so feel, please feel free to to contact me if you have some questions or some points of clarification um, in the course of the discussion or other things as well that might be related to teaching and learning okay. so my points for discussion for this morning would just be for these three ideas that of what is curriculum mapping, how do we engage in curriculum mapping, what awaits us after prudently engaging in curriculum planning. If you would do a simple Google search of what curriculum planning is, more likely you would come up or hit this particular website that tells you that curriculum planning simply refers to the alignment of learning standards and teaching. Uh, the words used are rather easy, but uh, if we, of course, dip our fingers onto it and really would do curriculum mapping, uh, more likely you would say, well, uh, it's easier said than done. But uh, I hope and pray that with this short uh, uh, lecture video, we get to have at least a working understanding of what curriculum mapping is. And perhaps if there would be other venues for seminars or teacher training, then you get to enhance, of course, what curriculum mapping is and, of course, apply to your um, practice as they would say a curriculum a coherent curriculum is actually something that is characterized by three things one it's well organized which is purposively designed to facilitate learning of course we know very well that the student is of course the end all and be all of all efforts in the educational process or the educative process it's actually free from academic gaps and needless repetitions, but uh, we have to recognize that in the uh, current K-12 curriculum, the concept of repetition there is moving towards mastery. That's the reason why the progression is actually spiral. And it is something that is aligned across lessons, courses, subject areas, and even grade levels. In particular, curriculum mapping aims to actually achieve the following things. Um, these are more of the kinds of orientations that we get to uh, engage ourselves into if we're already doing curriculum planning. One, or curriculum mapping. One is that there's going to be vertical coherence, horizontal coherence, subject area coherence, and interdisciplinary coherence. So what do we actually mean by vertical coherence? Vertical coherence means that there's a progression across grade levels, wherein the competencies or the skills actually build upon one another. And it is for this simple reason that the learner actually experiences over a period of time the concept of flow. If we are familiar with Shisen Milhai's flow model, that's actually the ideal one, wherein the student is actually focused and happy. Um, it is for the simple reason that over a period of time, you were able to develop already the competencies among the students. So that would mean whatever would be the learning uh, activities, assessments for, assessment as, and assessment of learning that you would actually give the student, the student would be able now to comply and complete the activities or the requirements i actually place onto this area over here uh something that perhaps uh, a lot of us know very well which is the hashtag laban the way i look at it hashtag laban having to observe how the how the hashtag actually evolved more likely it came from the students why it is for the simple reason that the students are trying their best to cope with the demands of of course being a student in terms of the academic requirements and they feel um, that they're rather incapable of doing some of those requirements, achieving what is supposed to be an ideal set of competencies. 
Hence, we always find these ones among the uh, social media posts of our students, the hashtag Laban. There will never be a hashtag Laban if we are able now to develop among our students that idea that they are actually a, as a focused and a happy student. Another one is horizontal coherence. Horizontal coherence means this is uniformity of skills developed. There's a check and balance of skills developed, and this actually is benchmarking of skills showcased or exhibited. One good example of this one would be the international assessments that the country actually gets into. One could be the PIMS. The other one is, of course, uh, that of the PISA. If you're going uh, to match the competencies of our students uh, alongside other students in other countries, do we actually meet what is expected of their grade level and age level? So that's actually horizontal coherence. So given, let's say, for example, one um, particular subject area, one particular grade level, do our own students actually exhibit the same competencies as that of their counterparts? Let's say, for example, in another school, in another division, in another province, for example. Another one would be this. Uh, this is also a, a meme or a photo that I often show uh, my students. And I'm pretty sure some of you teachers have seen this meme as well. Why is it that parents actually ask this question? Why is it that we have one and the same teacher? But look at the output in terms of the students. Of course, this is just going to be an allusion on the use of, let's say, for example, connectivity, that of Wi-Fi. The teacher is on 4G, but you get to have six students over here. One student is actually also on the same level, which is 4G. Another student is on 3G. One is on 2G. Uh, another student has a connection problem. Um, one student over here uh, has disconnected already with the teacher. Yet another student is already on airplane mode. Uh, this is what we are talking about and telling, like, for example, when we say the, 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 the student is actually physically present, but the mind is actually el elsewhere. So the mind is actually gallivanting already. And there are also some students who come to our class and they're already on shutdown mode. So that's actually one big question now for teachers. So again, this one actually aligns to um horizontal uh coherence another one is subject area coherence so do our students actually have the same skills this actually talks about how we collaborate as teachers this is the check and balance of skills that we actually develop you see within the department of your school you are not a self-contained unit you are part of a department so that means you have to check and balance within and among teachers if your students were able already to manifest, understand, apply, showcase these skills. But common in the faculty room, this is our perennial question to our co-teachers. Nasaan ka na? Anong topic mo na? Instead of actually asking your question this way, oh, can your students already do this particular skill? Can they already exhibit this particular competency? That's not really our usual line of thinking. Our usual line of thinking is really more of co uh, more of compliance to content rather than compliance to showcasing the skill that we are actually targeting for that particular week. Remember in the DEPED curriculum guide, it's very specific down to the level of every week, down to the level of the different macro skills across your subject areas. Another one is interdisciplinary coherence. Um, if you are familiar with the basic education curriculum of then Secretarial Raul Rocco, uh, this is the Makabayan, okay? Wherein subject areas could actually link with one another. Let's say, for example, the four uh, subject areas during the uh, BEC, we have, of course, uh, English, Filipino, math, science, and the last one is Makabayan. But it is actually assumed that on the ninth week or the tenth week, at the end of every uh, quarter, 
there has got to be an integration session. So what now is the output for the integration of all of those subject areas? So that is what interdisciplinary coherence is actually telling us. How does your subject area, how does the competency or co set of competencies develop in that particular time actually link with other subject areas as well? Okay. Second question that we have. A um, little bit of uh, greets here first. Hello, Ma'am Malin uh, Batangumapa of Tanawan City. Sir Kevin Kitson. Okay. Uh, Ma'am Reggie Villahermosa, classmate of my batch 1995 UST. Hello po. Jello Dacasin has joined us. Jay Rupert Yassis. Okay. Mary Joy Soleta uh, Sena. Annabel de la Cruz uh, Palmeri. Good morning po. So to continue, the second question is, how do we now engage in curriculum mapping? Okay. Perhaps my sharing onto this particular part would actually account for the more than 20 years that I've been in the teaching profession, since 1996. And I always would go by these uh, three concepts, or shall we say guidelines. One, always refer to the education law of 1982, which is Batas Pambasa 232. Okay. The K-12 curriculum guide and, of course, your school's vision, vision, mission, goals, and objectives. Second is that you have to require all teachers to actively participate in the process. Um, when I say require, it really means require. It's not even simply to enjoin. It is really required. Later on, I'll explain why did I rather choose the word required rather than to simply just say and join okay next is to present the curriculum map to your administrators for approval so first and foremost why is it that we have to refer to the education law of the night of 1982 or the batas from masaku 3 k-12 curriculum guide of DepEd, which is definitely available uh you simply have to google it up and i hope our partners i mean the parents as well would take time out to also download these curriculum guides because they are our partners. That's one thing that I often tell parents every time that I would attend a parent-teacher conference. Um, and of course, your school's vision, mission, goals, and objectives. One, of course, is that these three would actually provide a framework for the educative process. Where are we now being led? There's a theoretical framework for that. There's a conceptual framework for that. It ensures compliance to the education laws of the country, especially, of course, if there is, of course, a national assessment. Okay, that and NETRC has always a national assessment. If you're familiar with NCEE, if you're familiar with NEET or NSAT or NAT, there would always be a national assessment. Okay, offers synergy between education laws and the school's VNGO. It assures success in learning. It also leads to developing autonomous learners, which we would always want to have. This is actually that dream that all teachers and parents have, that our students okay, would actually know how is it to learn, especially in this day and age of um, information explosion. Uh, perhaps one good idea that I could share here, of course, is the Padag, which you will, uh, which is now version 5.0. Okay, I often tell my students in the teacher department and even in the TCP that in our generation as students, uh, of course, I belong to the so-called Gen Xers. I often joke around in telling class that I belong to the Agamulak generation. That if only we were given even just the prototype of the pedagogy wheel during those times that, let's say, for example, I was in high school or even in college, then all of us could have either graduated as honorable mention, a salutatorian, a, a valedictorian, a magna cum laude, a summa cum laude. But we never had those. So it only goes to show now that, of course, with this technology available for us, it's not just the applications in the pedagogy. It's really more of how is it that you maximize the skills 
that these tools for learning are actually giving you. As they would always say, to whom much is given, much is expected. Okay. So always remember also that in the Batas Masa 232 or the Education Act of 1982, as we are junior high school teachers, there are only two goals onto this one. But this is actually easier said than done because look at this one. It would actually ask from us or require from us that we continue to promote the objectives of, the, of elementary education. That's the reason why hats off and I really salute those in the elementary department, those in the elementary uh, schools, because they're actually building the foundation, the very foundations of learning. That th their task would actually be heavier than that of us in the junior high school level. Okay. Second, of course, is to discover enhanced aptitudes needed in the tertiary education. So you're also preparing your students for the next level. Junior high school is not to babysit your students. It is actually to, to, to build the capacity of these students so that they would be able now to meet the challenges of tertiary education. Of course, we are not going to pass the students simply because we're promoting out of incompetence. It's boot kicking. It's wrong to say that. When we actually uh, sign that the student is a candidate for graduation, let's say, for example, in the junior high school, senior high school level, we put there our assurance that this student is going to be able now to meet the challenges of tertiary education. For the teachers of English, this definitely is very familiar to you. This is the conceptual framework okay, for English language education in the country. And there is one particular goal there. And the goal is meaning making through language. All curriculum guides have this framework. This is the reason why all teachers should actually know very well, master very well their curriculum guide because there's a basis how we, how we uh, teach and how is it that we ensure quality education? How is it that we assure our students of success in learning? Okay. A while ago, I actually gave this gave this um, concept. But before I explain this one, um, yes, Sir Van Eracho, um, vertical coherence is the same with spiral progression. That's supposed to be that way. It is vertically articulated. The skills actually build up on one another. You're doing capacity building among the students. Okay. So going back to this one, why is it that I, I chose the word require rather than to enjoin? Your department chair cannot do this one. Not even a, a, a select group of teachers within your department. You have to put in all of the possible human resources needed there. And that is you. My fellow teacher, you are required to actively participate in the process. This actually champions now the grassroots approach of Hilda Taba. Why you are the frontliner in this process of education? You know better because you are there in the classroom level. Okay? It assures that skills are actually mapped out. Uh, perhaps one uh, thing that you would more likely Google upon when you uh, check curriculum mapping is the concept of orphan competencies or orphan skills. Orphan skills would actually tell you that these are the skills or competencies which were not mapped out. And we don't want that, that there's a particular skill that was not addressed in your curriculum map. If we match your curriculum map with the curriculum that is given by DepEd, well, the problem actually would start there. But what if, for example, DEP and NITRC would actually test that particular skill and your student did not develop that skill? Well, that's tantamount to like what? Shortchanging your students. Okay. It creates an avenue for systematic and, of course, reflective practice because everyone knows what is going. Okay. Every detail of what is going from grade 7 to grade 10. Okay. This is very um, common. I simply copy this one from the fire triangle uh, in chemistry or in physics. To build fire, you get to have, of course, components. But in this diagram, 
my focus is on alignment. So where is it and how is it that we attain curricular and curriculum alignment? First and foremost, you have to understand that there is, of course, a target skill. And that has been given already by DepEd. Okay? So do not formulate your own competencies. Just follow DepEd's curriculum guide. Trust your technical panel. That when the curriculum is handed down to you, it is already something that is good for uh, implementation. Your um, academic freedom as a teacher comes in, of course, with your specific strategy. And I hope and pray that, of course, you have your uh, wide repertoire of strategies. And, of course, what goes with a specific strategy is an appropriate assessment. Again, dear teachers, there is no such thing as a panacea strategy, a cure-all and an end-all and be-all strategy, and a panacea assessment. It has to be tailor-fitted to the target skill. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence onto this one. Next, skills developed in grade 6 are carried over to grade 7 uh, to 10. Okay? So... That would mean you really have to identify what were those skills? What are those skills that grade 6 students are bringing together, okay? Bringing with them to grade 7. You map them out, okay? And next to this one is that the carried over skills should lead to progress and learning. Because if they have been already attained or more likely would be in the intermediate or mastery level, Okay. So you have to maintain that one also across the different grade levels. That's the reason why you really have to download the entire curriculum guide K-12 to for your subject area. So at least you would know what is it that the grade 6 student is actually bringing in as a set of competencies or skills from grade 6. And of course, you have to identify, are there target skills? Or new skills that are in grade 7, well, this one should be at the introductory level. Okay. The new skills, of course, must progress to intermediate or attained level until such time the students have already mastered it across the different levels. Um, I do not know if you could see this diagram uh, on your screen. This is, of course the concept of um, universal design for learning. I hope and pray that everyone has at least um, uh, an idea of UDL, what UDL is, okay? First and foremost, there is what we may call um, an introduction. There's a processing part and there's a concluding part. In particular, the introductory uh, phase over here talks about multi providing multiple means of representation. So this one highlights your teaching strategies. There'd always be a specific way to best uh, present okay, your content as you develop, of course, the skill. The second is Provide multiple means of action and expression, which is, of course, that of the learning styles of your students. Your students actually learn in different ways. Uh, my usual um, example here is that in this day and age of uh, digital natives, the digital natives actually hold different things. Okay, onto their left hand, they could actually be holding onto a remote control. Let's say, for example, there's educational TV that they're also watching. Onto their right hand, they're actually holding onto a mouse as they're trying to surf the internet. In front of them, there's, of course, a textbook that you have provided. May it be in hard copy or the ebook version, whatever it is. And a host of other devices as well. Okay. So the student actually has a lot of ways and means possible okay, to learn about the concept. And that's one thing that we have to understand. The students now have a very fast 
uh, reception or ability to actually gather information. Okay? And of course, the last one is the effective network, which means to provide multiple means of engagement. And my focus here is, of course, onto the relevance of the competency to the content that you're actually using, learning content that you're using. What is the relevance of that particular skill for them? Hence, of course, I also placed here the perennial question of every student. That is, of course, what's in it for me? E, ano ngayon sa akin? What's in it for me if I will have to listen to this teacher, if I would have to engage in his activities, if I would have to engage with my fellow students as we are being asked, let's say, for example, to do, let's say, a group work. There has got to be an articulation over and above what is simply cognitive. Of course, include a wide repertoire of teaching strategies and developing the target skills. To this one, I clearly suggest that you as a team within your department identify what are the usual strategies that you use. Second, are there other strategies that perhaps the other subject areas are actually using which you may actually incorporate? So put them on a list. My suggestion is that um, map them out in such a manner that if you have already used this strategy in developing one competency, in developing the other competencies now, choose other competencies. And that actually paves the way for a variety of teaching materials. You see, our students uh, get to be, uh, how do you call this one, disengaged already. If they could already predict what is it that they're about to experience in the learning session. Okay. Kung alam na alam na po nila kung ano mangyayari sa klase ninyo, sa araw-araw ng pagkikita po ninyo. Okay. There is no more drive. I think in educational psychology, we actually would remember that particular theory, the drive reduction theory. If there is no more motivation, there is no more drive to learn, the students would actually disengage. That's the reason why sometimes the students would rather prefer, prefer something which is highly uh, interactive by nature, okay? rather than to have it, let's say, something which is rather static. Okay? Also, alongside this one is this. What comes with teaching or the teaching, teaching strategies is to include a variety of assessment tools. Always remember, meron pong tatlo. There would always be assessment for learning, which is actually formative. How did you prepare the students prior to coming to your class? Uh, ha I have actually coined this particular term. I call it, um, I, I call this one academic jousting. What is academic jousting? That no one in his right mind, either as a teacher or a student, would dare enter the classroom if he is not prepared. First and foremost, the teacher should have prepared the student prior to coming to class. That's the reason why you're actually giving them assignments. That's the reason why the, the, the morning after they would actually come in with the homework because they came in prepared. You also came in prepared because you burned the midnight lamp preparing. Let's say, for example, you're teaching learning materials and I hope and pray it does not get to be limited only to a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. For the next generation of teachers, you know this one very well. Uh, PowerPoint could actually be something that is not really that appealing not to our students. Second, of course, is assessment as learning. There has got to be uh, a set of activities to check whether or not our students are actually developing the skills within the session. Okay? And, of course, the last uh, portion is assessment of learning, which is actually summative in nature. This is where, of course, your usual written tests actually come along. It may be the long test or the periodical test. This is where your assessment task or the performance task comes along. And I hope and pray, dear teachers, that the performance task literally is not just a performance. There are different ways by which we could engage our students rather than to just asking them to do a performance. Uh, perhaps you could ask them to, let's say, for example, um, come up with a simple report, a written report, 
Another one is to convert that written report into an oral report. You could ask them to come up with, let's say, for example, a, a diorama or a prototype. Okay. Or perhaps they could have, let's say, an innovation or an invention. Okay. There are different ways by which we could have our performance task. Not simply asking our students to group together and do a performance of something, okay? And um, of course, so this one, I would have to touch base, of course, with the depth of knowledge. Depth of knowledge would actually tell us the progression of how we develop knowledge among our students. Okay? So first and foremost is, of course, just recognizing what the knowledge is, or what is the content? How can the knowledge actually be used? Okay. The third one is how and why could knowledge be used? And the last one, how else could we use the knowledge? So again, there's always going to be a progression of how we engage our students in the learning process. It's not just something which is cognitive, but it should actually move towards something which is already articulating creativity, innovation, and of course, sharing of what has been created. Key point number nine, include learning materials support in the, uh, this is of course supported curriculum that help actually target skills. Uh, to this one, as the banner of uh, Vival onto this um, live learning session is actually uh, telling you, um, I was one of the writers and editor of the language and literature series of Vibal. And among us writers and editors, this is our uh, commitment, of course, in making sure that the supported curriculum through these particular textbooks okay, help develop the target skills. And I would like to commend my co-editor, Dr. Uh, Nick Galvez, in uh, instilling that in this textbook series, we actually included the ed competencies, which actually is the complete uh, skill, as of course indicated in the ed curriculum guide, that actually has, of course, the, um, the code in itself. Okay. And I'm very happy that Vibal, I think one or two days ago, they actually came up with this um, criteria or requirements of good instructional materials. And I really agree with all of these things. And definitely these are those that actually characterize all of the learning materials that come, of course, from Vibal Publishing. Point number 10, make sure that all skills are mapped across the grading periods and across grade levels. I was mentioning a while ago the orphan skill. You don't want to have any skill left out because you and I know that DepEd and TRC more likely would be giving a, a national test. And what if, for example, that test would actually call for an assessment of that skill that you were not able to map out on your on your curriculum map. That's a compromising situation. Okay? So that's the reason why curriculum mapping is a collective effort required of all teachers. So this is just a very simple example of how you would actually do curriculum mapping on moving on to the last few minutes of this discussion. So you get to find the skill in itself, the skill progression, the strategy, assessment, task, written assessment. You cannot really do away with the with the written assessment. But look at the assessment task. It's the same skill. And this one is in fourth year or grade 10 rather. So look at how it progressed. Okay. From the assessment task of a personal essay until such time that the student was able now to come up with an advocacy paper. The skill progression, look at that one. It might have been introduced in grade seven, but there are two levels of attain. 
A1 and then A2 until such time that the student has already mastered the skill. It's actually reading, but the output, of course, of reading is writing. Okay. Of course, present your output to your administrators for approval. This is, of course, in the alignment of curriculum map to your school's VMGO. It really has to be mapped out also with the school's vision, mission, goals, and objective. This is your commitment to assuring a unique quality of education being, of course, offered by your school. And, of course, this is the school's compliance with a set of school academic policies and guidelines. So what awaits us now, this last point, what awaits us now after prudently engaging in curriculum mapping? One, utilize, uh, utilizing the TOTE model by Miller, Gallanter, and Pribam. This is rather so 1960s, but I still find it relevant. Uh, data gathering in the course of the implementation, reporting of information from data gathered, and of course, using information and coming up with informed decisions, systematic teaching, and reflective practice. First, why do we have to use the TOTE model? Because it monitors learning progress leading to success. It identifies if ever there are gaps, loopholes, and areas of concerns. And remember, we don't want to have any orphan skill. We would want that all skills are actually covered. And it moves towards a continuous development because there is no uh, concept that it would eventually stop. Let's not be complacent with the curriculum map that we made. It should always be in uh, next one is uh, data gathering in the course of implementation. Forever. Um, can you just have a thumbs up if you could see me clearly? Again, can I just have a thumbs up if you could see me? Yeah, I get to find one thumbs up over there. Okay. So why do we have to do data gathering in the course of our implementation? One, it documents the implementation of the entire curriculum map. It engages everyone in the teaching learning process and it serves a rich resource for research. May it be at the level of your, of your class, an action research, or would you want to have it full blown in terms of qual quantitative, or perhaps you go to different uh, success stories of teachers or perhaps your department, your students do it qualitative, okay? Why do we have to report of the information from the data gathered? One, of course, it articulates link between the teaching uh, profession and, of course, that of research. These two are inseparable. Once you become a teacher, you're also saying yes to research. It creates a dialogue between, uh, between um, stakeholders and education. Okay? They have, of course, a right to know. Parents. Um, the administrators, okay? Everyone is actually supporting the school. Okay? It promotes, of course, a culture of research um, in the academia. Again, let me reiterate um, the data that you would gather once you roll out the curriculum that you have there serves a very good source of uh, research. So using information and coming up with the informed decision, systematic teaching, and reflective practice. So always remember, dear teachers, that best decisions are supported by evidence. So if you would claim that your curriculum works very well and would really uh, assure that there's quality education, is there an evidence? The evidence actually would come from the information that you gathered when you rolled out that curriculum map. There's synergy, of course, in the educative process, reducing or eliminating wastage. Just imagine if, for example, a, a grade 10 teacher would actually be surprised why is it that his students are not able to exhibit the skill that should have been developed earlier on. That's already educational wastage. And of course, the last one is it's actually our commitment 
to bring out the best among our students. Again, their teachers, and lagi ko po sinasabi, uh, in the teaching profession, it is always that we would want to build the capacities of our students in such a way that they get to be autonomous learners. In such a way that they get to, of course, uh, join us later on in the noble task of nation building. Uh, let me end now my short sharing in this live video uh, through a favorite um, quotation of mine coming from the poet William Butler Yeats. That education is not the feeling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. I hope and pray, dear teachers, that I have shared with you uh, in this short uh, session some points that could be perhaps reflected upon and be used in your practice. Again, if there are questions that you still wish to um, perhaps pursue an inquiry, a clarification, please do not hesitate uh, to send me an email and I'll gladly, of course, answer all of these questions. So, till next time, thank you very much, Vival, for this golden opportunity. Maraming salamat po and stay safe.